I'd like to welcome you today to today's telecast of True Hope for Today. Today we're going to be uh, starting uh, and looking at Psalm 52. I will wait on your name for it is good. The name of the Lord is good. Let's look at Psalm 52 verse 1. Verse 5, and then move down and look at verses 8 through 9. And they read, Why do you boast in evil, almighty man? The goodness of God endures continually. God shall likewise destroy you forever. He shall take you away and pluck you out of your dwelling place and uproot you from the land of the living. But I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. I trust in the mercy of God forever and ever. I will praise you forever because you have done it. And in the presence of your saints, I will wait on your name for it is good. You know, it doesn't take long after you become a Christian to see the wickedness of man around you. Especially if this wickedness is aimed at you or someone you know. Think of how much greater it would be if a whole group of people were killed because of what someone overheard you saying. You know, that would really be hard to take. I would think, anyway. You know, David knew that God would righteously deal with with sins God shall likewise destroy you forever you know the righteous also shall see fear and shall laugh at him saying here's a man who did not make God his strength but trusted in the abundance of his riches and strengthened himself in his wickedness you know in spite of what the wicked do around us it's so very important that we pray for their, their salvation. We know they're in. We know that God will deal with them. You know, no matter how much we think we want them to pay for what they've done, we must remember that we would be right there with them except for the grace of God. Psalm 53 says, the fool said in his heart, there is no God. You know, they're corrupt and have done abominable inequity. There is none who does good. God looks down from a heaven above the children of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek God. Every one of them has turned aside. They have together become corrupt. There is none who does good. No, not one. All oh, that the salvation of Israel would come out of Zion. When God brings back the captivity of his people, let Jacob rejoice and Israel be glad. That was the first three verses of Psalm 53 and, and also verse 6. Now I remember a time in the 1970s. When God is dead, signs were carried around by many. Was that a new thought just uh, for their time? Nah. Even here in David's time, many said there is no God. Just because they believed that didn't make it any less true, though. You know, take that thought with you wherever you go. Truth does not disappear in the face of unbelief. True Christians will always be in the minority. You know, wide is the way that leads to destruction, but narrow is the gate that leads to heaven. You know, our country uh, was established on democracy, and today our country seeks to spread that democracy to other nations. You know, democracy may be good for a government, but is it good when it comes to religion? You know, our relationship to God comes before our relationship to any country in which we reside. In many cases, both 
in the past and in the present, that attitude causes Christians to be persecuted, maybe even killed for their faith. You now, who was David speaking of in verse 6? All that the salvation of Israel would come out of Zion. You know, David was looking forward to the Messiah who would take the people out of captivity. That Messiah has come. Christ Jesus has freed us from the captivity of sin. Our true home now is in heaven. We're, you know, we're just strangers here. Let's look at Psalm 54 in its entirety. Save me, O God, by your name and vindicate me by your strength. Hear my prayer, O God, give ear to the words of my mouth. For strangers have risen up against me and oppressors have sought after my life. They have not set God before them. Behold, God is my helper. The Lord is with those who uphold my life. He will repay my enemies for their evil. Cut them off in your truth. I will freely sacrifice to you. I will praise your name, O Lord, for it is good. For he has delivered me out of all trouble. And my eye has seen its desire upon my enemies. Yeah, David wrote this 54th uh, Psalm when the Zephites uh, went out and told Saul that David was hiding among them. You know, again and again, King Saul would seek to kill David, and yet God continually delivered him from the hands of Saul. You know, David's faith in the Lord never wavered during this time. Neither did he complain against God because of his circumstances. Now, look at the pattern of this psalm. In verses 1 and 2, David cried out to God for help. In verse 3, he acknowledges his enemies as those who have not set God before them. Then in verse 4 and 5, he expresses his utmost faith in God. And then in verse 6 and 7, are, are filled with praise to the God, for he has delivered me out of all trouble, and my eye has seen his desire upon my enemies. You know, I think we do well to adopt this pattern for dealing with our enemies. It's easier to complain or to talk about our enemies to others, but does that accomplish anything? You know, God is your helper. Live as though you truly believe that. Then you too uh, can say with David, he has delivered me out of all trouble. Psalm 55, verses 12 through 14, and also uh, we'll continue on in that psalm and read uh, verses 16 through first part of 19. And they read, For it is not an enemy who reproaches me, then I could hear it, nor is it one who hates me, who has exalted himself against me, then I could hide from him. But it was you, a man my equal, my companion and my acquaintance. We took sweet counsel together and walked in house of God in throng. As for me, I will call upon God and, and the Lord shall save me. Evening and morning and at noon I will pray and cry aloud and he shall hear my voice. He has redeemed my soul in peace from a battle that was against me for there were many against me. God, will you hear and afflict them, even if he abides from the old? You know, we're in a battle, folks. In writing Psalm 55, David understood that. He said, he has redeemed my soul in peace from a battle that was against me. You know, it's hard to understand that, especially if you've lived in a peaceful country. You know, in the midst of that peace and tranquility, Satan and his angels are busy warring against uh, God and his people. And, you know, they will not stop until God has defeated Satan for the last time at the end of the world. You know, during the war in Vietnam, the U.S. soldiers, 
They had to learn to uh, fight using new military tactics, guerrilla warfare. You know, the enemy would hide and camouflage so that uh, he was not easily detected. You know, sometimes they would even uh, use women and children to infiltrate an outpost and destroy it. You know, I believe Satan has always used guerrilla warfare. The Bible says that he appears to us as an angel of light. We would recognize him if, if he appeared to us in a red suit with a long tail and a pitchfork in his hand. Instead, he uses very nice people, sometimes even our best friends, to make us weak and to destroy our testimony for Christ. You know, sometimes he presents religion to us and a half-truth. Now, how many groups and cults do you know of who claim to believe the Bible, and yet they deny most of it? You know, become a person of constant prayer and fellowship with God. Cast your burden on the Lord, and he shall sustain you. He shall never permit the righteous to be moved. And that's later on in that 55th Psalm in verse 22. Pray to the Lord in the evening and in the morning and at noon. Now God alone is able to guide you and to keep you from falling into Satan's uh, slippery trap. I want to look at Psalm 56 now. And read verses 3 and 4 and verses 8 through 11. And they read, Whenever I'm afraid, I will trust in you. In God, I will praise his word. In God, I will put my trust. I will not fear. What can flesh do to me? You number my wanderings. Put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? When I cry out to you, then my enemies will turn back. This I know because God is for me. In God I will praise his word. In the Lord I will praise his word. In God I have put my trust. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? So does God know when we hurt? Does he care? You know, many times it seems as though God is distant from us and doesn't know our troubles even exist. You know, that's not the case, though. That's not true. God keeps our tears in his bottle, and he writes them in his book. You now, see how completely David believed and trusted this in verse 3? Whenever I'm afraid, I will trust in you. As if this is not enough, David continues when I cry out to you, then my enemies will turn back. This I know because God is for me. Not only does God put our tears in the bottle, okay, and write them in his book, but we can also say with David, God is for me. David didn't just believe this. He, he knew it was true. You know, that kind of faith comes from God alone. You know, when we really know and understand these truths and make them our own standard for living the Christian life, then what can man do to me? This sure does simplify our walk with the Lord, doesn't it? Uh, Psalm 55 reminded us that God never allows a true Christian to be deceived by the craftiness of Satan. And Psalm 56 tells us that God is personally aware of all of our troubles. Not just some of our troubles, but all of our troubles. And whenever we're afraid, we can put our complete trust in our God. Psalm 57, verses 7 through 11 say, uh, My heart is steadfast, O God. Oh God, my heart is steadfast. I will sing and give praise. Awake, my glory. Awake, lute and harp. I will awaken the dawn. I will praise you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing to you among the nations. For your mercy reaches into the heavens. 
and your truth unto the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be above all the earth. You know, we're creatures of this world. We live in a world and we think of this world. Everything that pertains to our life from birth to death is grounded in this world. God is not so. God is above the earth. As a matter of fact, God is above the heavens. Now, how we try to bring God down to our level and how we try to bring ourselves up to God's level, you know, neither, neither is possible. Would you really want it any other way? Would you want a God who's Roots are in the earth, and therefore he can be persuaded to go one way or another simply by our whims. You know, we understand gods of this type, for Greek mythology is filled with them. You know, our God is above the earth and all of heavens. We'll never really understand him while trapped in these bodies of sin, okay? But we can at best see through a glass darkly. Christianity is a religion of faith. Though we cannot see God as he truly is, yet in faith we know that it is true. We know and sing praises to God for his mercy reaches into the heavens and his truth into the clouds. You know, what a glorious God who leads us up to him where eventually we will live forever. Now try to remember that as you go about your day, by God's grace, try to live above the circumstances of life as you look to God for help and his guidance. Psalm 58, uh, we uh, get into uh, this fact that God is the God who judges the earth. And we're going to look at uh, verses 1 and 2 of the 58th Psalm and then move down and read verses 9 through 11. And they read, Do you indeed speak righteousness, you silent ones? Do you judge uprightly, your sons of men? No, in heart you work wickedness. You weigh out the violence of your hands in the earth. Before your pots can fill the burning thorns, he shall take them away as with a whirlwind, as in his living and burning wrath. The righteous shall rejoice when he sees the vengeance. They shall wash his feet in the blood of the wicked, so that men will say, Surely there is a reward for the righteous. Surely he is a God who judges in the earth. Okay, here's a warning, folks. Psalm 58 is not politically correct. In our world today, judgment for the wicked is not politically cor correct. Mercy is shown to everyone in hopes of rehabilitating them. You know, it sounds wonderful and all that. It would be true. As Christians, we must understand the true heart of man. We are all conceived in sin. And that sin will never leave us while we live on this earth. Now, what can we do? How can we hope to face God in such a state? You know, sin came into this world through one man, Adam. Delivering from this sin also came in the world by one man, the God-man, Jesus Christ. You know, Christ alone was not born into sin, but was born totally righteous and pure. He alone had the ability to pay for the sins of man. You know, our only hope then is to fall before Christ, asking for his forgiveness from him, and crying out to him to deliver us from the sin and misery, claiming him as the Lord and Master of our lives. You know, it almost sounds too easy. Then why doesn't everyone cry out to God for salvation? 
The Bible says that few there are that find this life in Christ. Satan goes about like a lion deceiving and devouring man so effectively that few cry out to God for life. What happens to the unbelievers? Well, at the end of time, God will judge the wicked and the saints will rejoice and they will see the vengeance taken upon wicked people who refuse to bow to the knee of Christ. So what do we do now? As believers in Christ, we continue to cry out for the salvation of the wicked and continue to ask God to help us to be a testimony before the world of his righteousness, his love and power, and his forgiving grace to those who will come to him. Let's look at Psalm 59. For God is my defense. Psalm 59, verses 8 through 10, and also uh, verses 16 through 17. If you read with me, they say, But you, O Lord, shall laugh at them. You shall have all the nations in the region. I will wait for you, O you, his strength. For God is my defense. My God of mercy shall come to meet me. God shall let me see my desire on my enemies. But I will sing of your power. Yes, I will sing aloud your mercy in the morning. For you have been my defense and my refuge in the day of my trouble. To you, O oh my strength, I will sing praises. For God is my defense, my God of mercy. So don't forget that we're in a battle and don't forget whose side you're on. You know, here in the 59th Psalm we find David. Again being pursued by Saul, who has sent men to watch the house so they could kill David. Yeah, it's not hard to remember you are in a battle when the enemy is constantly pursuing you. While it was uh, a great grief to David to be constantly running for his life, he never forgot that he was on the winning side. You know, even when it seemed as though all would be lost, he still said, God is my defense, my God of mercy. So what about us? We're also constantly being pursued by Satan, who hopes to take as many people as he can to be on his side, and then to discourage and discredit God's people that are attested that their testimony will have no effect on those around them. Does it work? Oh, yes, it does. Look at the world powers today. How many of them truly claim God as their leader? Does that discourage us and make, make us afraid that we are losing the battle? Let's look at verse 8. But you, O Lord, shall laugh at them. You shall say, you shall have all the nations into regions. So in reality, the war is already over, okay? And God is one. It is Satan's best kept secret, okay? He knows he is already defeated. But he's not about to admit it. Not while there are still people he can persuade to join his side. So give us help from trouble, for the help of man is useless. Though God, we will do valiantly, for it is he who shall tread down our enemies. Psalm 60, verses 11 through 12. You know, what amazing truth is taught in verses 11. The help of man is useless. You now, how many do you know who understand and believe verse 11? You know, we live in a culture today that believes the opposite. The help of God is useless. The God of this world is man, okay? No one created us. We evolved. That makes us a highest being. 
and everything you see around you is due to the glory of man. You know, look at the great achievements made in the last hundred years. Sounds pretty convincing, doesn't it? So, but don't be deceived by such thinking. God is not mocked. He is long-suffering, which we tend to in interpret as he is not there. So where is he then? I find it fascinating that this world is filled with stories of good witches and bad witches, good demons and bad demons, and good spirits and evil spirits. And I think this shows a deeper understanding that is innate in all of us. There is a true spiritual realm in which God reigns with his angels, and Satan constantly attacks and devours with his evil angels. So in this spiritual realm, man is truly useless. His power comes from Christ or Satan, and there is no other. This spiritual realm is not under the bidding of man. Rather, man is led by this spiritual realm. Now, Christian, don't ever forget that. Don't look around you in discouragement and wonder where God is. He is always there and always ready to fight the forces of Satan to protect you. That's going to be the end of today's telecast. Until the next time, may God bless you richly. Thank you. Hi, I'm Dr. Timothy, Senior Ministry Leader of True Hope Ministries of America, thanking you so much for watching True Hope for Today with our Director of Teaching Ministries, Dr. Michael Cochran. Right now, we have a special invitation for those of you in some type of ministry, regardless of your time in ministry, but especially if you're a ministry leader. The Christian Post recently reported that nearly half the ministers surveyed are seriously thinking about quitting the ministry because they suffer from being alone in their journey. This is especially true for those who stand strong in biblical Christian ministry. But you should know that being alone is not God's plan for ministry service and leadership. For instance, as they faced such great adversity, the early apostles were joined together in an apostolic community, plus they had the benefits of faithful companions who joined with them as they ministered. As you know, today's culture is increasingly opposed to the ministry and to the ministers of Christ. So we too need the strengths of a ministry community, plus the benefits of having faithful spiritual companions. With this in mind, we encourage you to discover True Hope Ministries of America. Our community members are servants and leaders in biblical Christian ministry, ranging from group Bible study teachers to pastors and others in ministry leadership. Our members include those with every ministry gift, and we all come from diverse backgrounds in both denominational and non-denominational ministry. Our God-given mission is simply this to help one another do what God has called each of us to do. This means our membership help each other when called upon. And in our separate localities, we look for ways to help other ministers do what God has called them to do, even if it's just to pray with them. To learn more about us, scan the QR code on the screen, visit our website, or give us a call. And by the way, if we can't answer the moment you call, Please leave a message because I promise we'll return your call just as soon as we possibly can. Thanks for sharing these few moments. And until next time, may God bless you with great faith for these days.